Fatality. Along the eastern terrace, a youth and maiden were pacing slowly. They had stolen or unsee from the rabble, and passing through a door standing invitingly open, had entered the garden. Though overjoyed in each other's presence, the solemn beauty of the night, so powerful in its contrast to the riotous scene they had just quitted, profoundly impressed them. Above were the deep serene heavens, lighted by the starry horse and their radiant queen. Below, the immemorable woods, steeped in silvery mist, arising from the Flowing past the whole and nature was hushed in holy rest, in opposition to the flood of soft light emanating from the lovely planet overhead, and which turned all it fell on, whether tree or tower, or stream to beauty, or the artificial leg, or by the forces near the building, while this horde and sound occasioned by the princes tuning their instruments disturbed their rewards. As they went on, however, these sounds were lost in the distance, and the glare of the torches was excluded by intervening trees. Then the moon looked down lovingly upon them, and the only music that reached their ears arose from the nightingale. After a pause, they walked on again, hand in hand, gazing at each other, at the glorious heavens, and drinking in the thrilling melody of the songsters of Rue. At the angle of the terrace was a small arbor placed in the middle of a lost wood, and they sat down within it. Then, and not till then, did their thoughts find vent in words, forgetting the sorrows they had endured, and the perils by which they were environed. They found in their deep mutual love is shield against the sharpest arrows of air. In low, gentle accents, they breathe their passion solemnly, plighting their faith before all seeing heaven. Poor souls, they were happy, their intense sleep happy. Alas, that their happiness should be so short, or those few moments of list stolen from a waste of tears were all that were allowed them. Inexorable fate still dogged their footsteps amidst the mosques and listened to their converse. A little girl with high shoulders and sharp features. On which diabolical malice was sound two yellow eyes listening through the leaves beside her marked the vengeance of a cat. As the lovers breathed their vows and indulged in hopes never to be released, the witch child grin clenched her hands and pushed them. Their short lived happiness seemed inclined to interrupt his son. The motive, however, kept her quiet. What are the pair talking of now? She hears her own name mentioned by the maiden who speaks of her with pity, almost with affection, pardons her for the mischief she is under, and hopes heaven will harden her likewise. But she knows not all except girl's malignity, or even her gentle heart must have been roused to resentment. The little girl, however, feels no compunction. Infernal malice has taken possession of her heart and crushed every kindly feeling within it. She hates all though that compassion is her, and returns evil good. What are the lovers talking of now? Of their first meeting at Warley Abbey, when one once made me, and by her beauty and simplicity won the other's heart, losing her own at the same time, bright on cloud and career seemed to lie before them, then woefully added dark and since Alas, alas, the little girl smiles, she hopes they will go on. She likes to hear them talk us past happinesses ever remembered with hang by the wretch, and they were happy then. Go on, go on. But they are silent for a while, for they wish to dwell on that horrible, that blissful season, and a nightingale alighting on a ball above them pours for its sweet plaint, as if in response to their tender emotions, they praise the bird's song, and it suddenly ceases. For the little girl, full of male violence, stretches forth her hand, and it drops to the ground as if stricken by a dart. Is thy heart broken, poor bird? exclaimed the young man, taking up the hapless songster, yet warm and palpitating to die in the midst of thy song. It is hard, very hard, I mean it here. Its fate seems a type of our own. The little girl laughed but in a low tone, and to herself. The pair then grew sad, the slight incident had touched them deeply, and their conversation took a melancholy turn. They spoke of the lights that had nipped their love in the blood, of the canker that had eaten into his heart, of the destiny that so relentlessly assured them, threatening to separate them forever. The little girl laughed merrily. Then they spoke of the grave, and of hope beyond the grave, and they spoke cheerfully. The little girl could laugh no longer, for with her all beyond the grave was this. Fair. After that, they spoke the terrible power that Satan had lately obtained in that unhappy district of the hearts he had employed, and of the votaries he had won or prayed fervently that his snares might be circumvented and his rule destroyed. During this part of the discourse, the cat swelled to the size of a tiger, and his eyes 
Lord's Lord like fire and behold, he made a motion as if he would spring forward, but the voice of prayer arrested him and he shrank back to his former size. Poor Janet is ensnared by the fine murmured the maiden, and will perish eternally. Would I could save her? It cannot be replied a young man, she is beyond redemption. The little girl gnashed her teeth with rage, but my mother, I do not now despair of her, said Alison. She has broken the bondage by which she was enchained, and if she resists temptation to the last, I am assured she will be saved. Heaven aid her, exclaimed Richard. Scarcely were the words uttered than the cat disappeared. Why, Tip, where are you, Tip? I want you, cried a little girl in low tone. But the familiar did not respond to the call. What can he have gone, cried Janet. Tip, Tip, still the cat. Tip. Not then, I must do the work without him, pursued the little girl. And I will no longer delay it. And with this, she crept stealthily round the arbour, and approaching the side where Richard sat, watched an opportunity of touching him unperceived. As her finger came in contact with his frame, a pang like death shot through his heart, and he fell upon Alison's shoulder. Are you ill? She exclaimed, gazing at his pallid features, rendered ghastly white by the moonlight. Richard could make no reply, and Alison, becoming dreadfully alarmed, was about to fly for assistance, but a young man, by a great effort, detained her. I mun now run and tell Mr. Potts so that you may be found with him, muttered Janet, creeping away. Just then, Richard recovered his speech, but his words were faintly uttered, and with difficulty. Alison, he said, I will not attempt to disguise my condition from you. I am dying, and my death will be attributed to you, or even mind persons have persuaded the king that you have bewitched me, and he will believe the charge now. Or if you would ease the pangs of death for me, if you would console my latest moment, leave me and quit this place before it be too late. Oh, Richard, she cried distractedly, you ask more than I can perform. If you are indeed in such imminent danger, I will stay with you, will die with you. No, live for me, live, save yourself, Alison, implored the young man. Your danger is greater than mine, a dreadful death awaits you, I say. Oh, mercy, mercy, heaven, spare her, in pity, spare her. Have we not suffered enough? I can no more. Farewell forever. Alice, one kiss, the last. And as their lips met, his strength utterly forsook him, and he fell backwards. One grave, he murmured. One grave, Alison. And so, without a groan, he expired. Alison neither screamed nor swooned, but remained in a state of stupefaction, gazing at the body as the moon fell on the glassy features. They looked as if locked in a slumber. There he lay, the young, the brave, the beautiful, the loving, the beloved. Fate had triumphed. Death had done his work, but he had only performed half his task. One grave, one grave, it was his last wish, it shall be so, she cried in frenzied tones. I shall thus escape my enemies and avoid the horrible and shameful death to which they would doom me. And she snatched the dagger from the ill-fated youth's side. Now fate I defy thee, she cried with a fearful laugh. One last look at that calm youthful face, one kiss of the cold lips which can no more return the endearment. And the dagger is pointed at her breast, but she is withheld by an arm of iron and a weapon falls from her grasp. She looks up a tall figure clothed in the mouldering habiliments of a Cistercian monk stands beside her. She knows the vestments at once, for she has seen them before hanging up in the closet adjoining her mother's chamber at Warley Abbey, and the features of the ghostly monk seem familiar to her. Raise not thy hand against thyself, said Phantom in a tone of awful reproof. It is divine. Promise thee to do it. He will take advantage of thy misery to destroy thee. I took thee for thine, replied Alice, gazing at him with wonder rather than terror. Who art thou? The enemy of thy enemies, and therefore thy fine, replied the monk. I would have saved thy lover if I could, but his destiny was not to be averted. But rest content, I will avenge it. I do not want vengeance, I want to be with him, she replied, frantically embracing the body. Thou wilt soon be with him, said Phantom, in tones of deep significance. Arise and come with me, thy mother needs thy assistance. My mother, exclaimed Alison, clearing the blinding tresses from her brow. Where is she? Follow me, and I will bring thee to her, said the monk, and leave him. I cannot, cried Alison, gazing wildly at the body. You must, the soul is at stake, and will perish if you come not, said the monk. He is at rest, and you will speedily rejoin him. With that assurance I will go, replied Alison, with a last look at the object of her love. One grave lay us in one grave. It shall be done according to your wish, said the monk. And he glided on with noiseless footsteps. Alison followed him along the terrace. Presently they came to a dark yew tree wall, leading to a labyrinth, and tracking it swiftly, as well as the overarched and intricate path to which it conducted, they entered a grotto whence a flight of steps descended to a subterranean passage hewn out of the rock along this passage, which was of some extent the monk proceeded, and Alison followed him. At last they came to another flight of steps, and here the monk stopped. We are now beneath the pavilion, where you will find your mother, he said. Mount away is clear before you. I have other work to do. Alison obeyed, and as she advanced, was surprised to find the monk gone. He had neither passed her nor ascended the steps, and must therefore have sunk into the earth.